Releasing on August 20th on the Nintendo Switch, Phenotopia Awakening marks the latest indie attempt at capturing the wondrous adventure style of The Legend of Zelda, although this time things are a bit different. Rather than appropriating the classic top-down Zelda gameplay like so many others before it, Phenotopia aims to make a side-scrolling journey in the vein of Zelda 2. Featuring some gorgeous sprite work, animation, and lighting, a charming cast of characters full of expressive dialogue, a surprisingly long story with tons of side content, and several mechanics inspired by games released during Phenotopia's long six-year development cycle, this game has the potential to be one of the most unique and special indie titles of 2020. However, thanks to some key pitfalls with pacing, and even with some core mechanics thanks to its derivation of larger franchises, Phenotopia Awakening may have more promise than it's capable of delivering. Priced at $20, is Phenotopia the right game for you to buy? Thanks to a review copy provided by the developer Cape Cosmic, that's exactly what I'm here to answer today, so let's dig in. If you were an avid visitor of Newgrounds back in the day, this game may ring a bell, and that's because Phenotopia Awakening is more or less a full-scale reboot of the original Flash game Phenotopia, taking you through a fleshed-out, updated version of the original world. Unlike many fantasy games like its inspiration Zelda, Phenotopia takes place on Earth, centuries after some apocalyptic event drove humanity into underground bunkers. Our protagonist is Gale, a pink-haired orphan who quickly becomes the elder of her village as every adult is abducted by aliens while the kids are playing in an ancient dungeon. You know, as you do. It's up to Gale to figure out the mystery behind her village's abduction and naturally save the world by trekking through several unique dungeons. Phenotopia takes pride in its Zelda II inspiration as Gale travels across the overworld in a top-down format before shifting to its side-scroller gameplay in towns, caves, dungeons, or when Gale runs into the monsters that pop up in the overworld. While these towns can look a bit overwhelming to traverse, and a couple of them definitely do get Byzantine, I've gotta point out a second time how beautiful this game is. These backdrops are breathtaking at points, which isn't something I thought I'd say about a sprite-based game in 2020. The use of lighting and color combined with the excellent atmosphere provided by the heavily Zelda-inspired soundtrack just nails every vibe that the team intended in any given location. Moreover, while the character sprites are definitely on the simple side and might be a bit off-putting at first glance, even the lesser NPCs have some bouncy, expressive animations. Our heroine Gale is of course the most expressive of all, even though she's mostly the silent protagonist type. Even her little wake-up animation after loading a save or restarting after dying is bubbly. Plus, her yawn sounds like a dead ringer of Toad from Mario, so I end up chuckling most of the times that I load the game up. Gale's combat controls are pretty simple. With the A button, she'll swing her trusty baseball bat, B is her jump button, and Y will activate her equipped item, whether it's a slingshot, crossbow, bombs, food items, or even her flute. Yes, there's even a flute. Phenotopia doesn't just follow Zelda's Black Sheep game. This game is ripe with spins on classic Zelda tropes, with this flute being the best example. Gale will use the flute to put together special songs to open doors, activate ancient seals, you've been down this road before. And I've gotta say, it's charming to see a game that takes so much of one of Nintendo's pillar franchises and reincorporates it in new and fun ways. In the case of the flute, for example, several health or stamina expansions will be locked behind note doors that don't require a specific song, but instead force Gale to put together what notes she needs to play based on implicit or written hints in her surroundings. As for how the combat actually plays, well, this is where I've got to put a damper on things because Phenotopia's combat isn't as deep as it wants to be. See, this game also takes pride in taking direct inspiration from several more recent games, including the one comparison that all game critics are afraid of making... <sighs> Dark Souls. For the record, I'm only making the comparison because the developer did it first in their email, but credit to them because to some extent they've got some ground to stand on by saying that. Every attack you perform, whether it's your bat or an item, will burn some of your stamina meter, and what's more, your bat attacks will deal less damage the lower your stamina is. This means that on paper, you can't just wail on the baddies, you have to assess the enemy patterns and strike with precision. This would be all well and good if the combat was as refined and calculated as a Souls game, but frankly, it's not even close. Outside of the bosses, most enemies have a few different attacks that they'll roll out without any set sort of pattern or strategy, which makes reading them up close a bit tough. 
And since the enemy attacks tend to come out very quickly and you don't start out with a safe dodge move or many ranged options for reasons I'll dive into shortly, many fights do just turn into wailing on them with the bat until either you win or you retreat to regain your stamina. This makes that damage decay as your stamina meter decreases a second form of punishment on the player that just isn't necessary, especially when Gale's range with the bat is so poor that you're only getting that close knowing that you're probably gonna take damage. Despite its Dark Souls inspiration, Phenotopia isn't Dark Souls. These mechanics don't feel earned or really all that satisfying, they just end up being frustrating. And when you're low on health, good luck finding a chance to heal. Like in many Souls and Souls-inspired games, each healing item has a set activation time, during which you cannot move unless you cancel out of it. Drink items may only take about a second, but larger cooked meals, because yes, this game also has a cooking mechanic, could take three to six seconds. Very few items let you heal right from the menu instantly, and even as early as Dungeon 2 or 3 when enemies are tossing projectiles all the time, you're gonna be hard pressed to find even one free second, let alone three. Even if you do find a free moment, good luck getting used to this game's wonky radial quick select menu where you use the right stick for some reason to quickly hot swap an item and then you press the stick in to select that item. Now as I'm sure many of you know, I'm a Ratchet and Clank guy. I know my radial quick select menus pretty well, but using R3 as an actually important button leaves me double checking every time I try to equip something and that's just not enjoyable. Even if entering this quick select menu paused the game like in something like Ratchet, it would be so much better, but then you would run into the issue of the game stopping anytime you accidentally touch the right stick, so no matter how you cut it, this is just unwieldy at best. Phenotopia's inventory starts you out with a paltry 8 slots and asks you to spend money to expand your carrying capacity. Thankfully, several semi-key items, although they're listed in the same inventory menu, don't count towards your max at least, and neither do things like Gale's weapons or armor. Even still, it'll take about 10 hours or longer for you to really start feeling comfortable with your inventory space thanks to yet another issue, perhaps this game's most fatal flaw, how long it takes to earn money. With how often this game requires the player to spend money to progress, especially in that opening 10 hours or so, this artificial wall is what kills the pace more than anything else. Enemies rarely drop money, or as it's called in this game, Rin, and when they do, it's usually 1 or 3 Rin at most. Instead, you're encouraged from the outset to explore every nook and cranny of every town and region that you visit to break open treasure chests that usually carry about 20 Rin. Credit where it's due here, the game does an excellent job of training you to explore and think outside the box in many locations both in and outside of the dungeons. And it's these tiny little eureka moments that are the most satisfying in the entire game. However, earning only 20 coins when most of the side quests ask you to spend 50 to 100 per area, when even basic items like a lamp for dark areas or a crossbow which may as well be necessary for progression or batter armor upgrades each cost 150 even in the second town and even when the main plot in that same town requires at least 60 coins for you to progress, you're not gonna have a great time. Even when I've exhausted most non-grinding options for money, I'm still scrounging and hoping to get the lucky 5 coin drops on enemies that I run into, or hoping that the game's optional dungeons don't just reward me with another health upgrade because I'd rather have the money at this point. Compounding this, even though I've explored every visible inch of every single town, at least up to the fourth major town when I was so tired of the game's pacing that I just started skimming through villages, I have not once found a catch-all merchant that will buy things from me. The closest I've found is a recycler that will throw away some of your items for what feels like pennies on the dollar, and using it actually feels a little bit insulting. What's this? A rare metal ore? Nah, the best I can do is like 15 bucks. Take it or leave it. Christ, this may as well be Pawn Stars. There's one fruit salesman in the desert city that will specifically buy the blue fruits found in the forest all the way back next to the starting town, but you need four fruits to earn only 25 coins. And early in the game, it's really tedious to ask players to go all the way back across a broken bridge through another area and across the overworld just to hit these fruit out of a tree and then break them open while ensuring that the final hit that breaks the fruit is light enough that it doesn't destroy the berries inside because dear god, why is that a thing? And then grab a handful of berries and then restart the game so that they respawn and repeat until their restricting inventory is almost full. And naturally, because of course, why wouldn't it be this way, most little side quests don't reward you with coins, in fact many of them require you to spend coins, but instead they give you moonstones, which you'll use to either upgrade some of your secondary weapons or add fast travel locations to the world map. 
Now, after a good chunk of time, you'll find an antique vendor that will give you 40 coins for some of those rare semi-key items that you've had sitting in your inventory for hours now, but by this point, most upgrades are now 200 to 300 plus, so that extra chunk isn't gonna do much when you're already behind on items. I never even bought the fishing rod so that I would never have to buy food again because I couldn't justify spending the 150 rin on it when I'd be better served saving up for something more necessary for, I don't know, not dying. And really, since every time you go back to Gale's home village, the kids will give you a handful of food and supplies, there's little reason to buy food once you have fast travel points. Just save whatever you can for the one or two combat upgrades you'll afford per area, and hope that you don't fall too far behind that the annoying bosses eat up another half hour of your life you wish you had back. If there was a combat arena or some easier way to earn money, or really if the in-game economy was just more fine-tuned to evenly reward the player, the wonky pacing would be greatly improved. An item like a lamp or a crossbow should be hidden away somewhere for you to find for free, whether in a dungeon or in a side area that's hinted at via dialogue. That way you're not spending Gale's life savings playing catch-up. In some sense, it feels fitting that this kid is scrounging for money in these expansive, sweeping cities, but just because it's tonally appropriate doesn't make it fun. That's a shame, because exploring these cities otherwise really can be a blast. Phenotopia throws a lot of smaller objectives in the way of each major dungeon to try and make the game feel more like a real adventure, and while these end up breaking the pace early on, I can appreciate what they're trying to do. In practice, though, it's draining to have to buy wine for an imprisoned bandit so that he'll tell you how to get to the dungeon, because to get that $30 bottle of wine, you've got to find one of Gale's friends who's also been imprisoned by the mayor of that town, borrow her ID because Gale's not old enough to buy booze, go to a hairdresser and spend 30 more dollars to dye Gale's hair brown to match her friend, buy the wine, give it to the prisoner, learn a song, then go to where he says only to find that you need bombs, which hopefully you put together when you found an abandoned locked bomb shop while scrounging for the 60 bucks you needed for these three basic required objectives, Meaning that you then have to find Gail's friend who's watching kids in an alleyway to ask her to pick the lock for you, at which point she asks you to watch the kids who then decide to play hide and seek in a city of probably 60,000 people, including one that jumps down into a dark well that you can barely see without the $150 lamp. I am convinced I am going insane. This, by the way, is to get to Dungeon 2. My heart actually sank in the third town when doing another set of filler objectives and somebody asked me for Gale's student ID. God, I, I thought I was doing it again. I thought I missed something. I thought I needed another ID only for them to say, nah, I'm just fucking with you. Let's go. And the thing is, that's pretty funny. I would have laughed if I didn't just spend hours of my life arbitrarily padding game length in the name of establishing an adventure vibe. In a game that's marketed as 25 to 50 hours, I would not be surprised if you could cut out a third of this game length by cutting down on this artificial bloat, and you'd end up improving the overall experience. This stuff is genuinely Shenmue bad at times here, and it just didn't have to be. And while the dungeons are super unique and usually super fun, very much breaking the mold of what the player would expect from a Zelda dungeon, thanks to the archaic checkpoint system, or lack thereof, these two run into tedium. If Gale dies, you have to reload your last save point, and thankfully there's always one right at the start of each dungeon with a little campfire nearby for you to cook food. However, when you die and respawn, you respawn with exactly the health you had when you last saved, except for some reason in Dungeon 2 when you're fully healed when you respawn, which may just be a bug, I'm honestly not sure. Once you're in a dungeon, it is a pain in the ass to leave and go somewhere else if you start running low on food, because the game will rarely, if ever, throw you a bone, and there's never a place to sleep to regain your health. What ends up happening for the first half or so of this game is that in every dungeon, you will do a single room, run back to the save point at the start, do another room, and repeat, because you don't have enough decent health items to want to risk them mid-dungeon, since you'll quickly learn that you definitely need to save them for the bosses, if you even have a chance to use them in boss rooms, because don't forget, healing leaves you a sitting duck for one to six seconds. The promising, fun design of these dungeons, like infiltrating a semi-friendly bandit base and completing challenges, or planning an entire castle siege from the basement to the uppermost tower, is soured by this constant sense of unwarranted punishment. Why throw me in rooms with several enemies at once if the enemies have somewhat random attack patterns, if they can even kick my bombs away, but the best I can do to them is hit them with a bat and hope I get out of the way before they deal 10 to 20 damage in retaliation? Why isn't there a safe dodge move built into this gameplay style if a Souls-esque stamina management was the intent, and no, the sprint dodge roll does not count because you are not safe while you do it, and it takes up more frames unless you perfectly cancel it when you're done with the dodge, why, god, why? Or a Zelda 2-inspired sword bounce 
move to give your poor range a more versatile aerial approach, or better yet, if these do exist, why is the game hiding them behind a $200 tutorial all the way in the third town several hours in? It truly feels like this game was in development for so long that every time another game came around with a new concept, Cape Cosmic threw it into the mix and further distracted from the focus in the name of expanding the sense of wonder and adventure. And it's an absolute shame, because despite so many of these issues that just drained me while I was playing, I did keep wanting to see what was next. The world and the lore was built well, the areas are just stunning and do end up being fun to explore in spite of all the filler. And those little eureka moments when unlocking a health upgrade or solving an optional puzzle at least made me momentarily forget about the fact that I'm broke and need to find or grind for more money to have a chance in the next dungeon. With how long Phenotopia Awakening is, it can certainly argue for that $20 price tag, but without some major changes and tweaks, I cannot recommend it at that price. The effort and the love and the care is put there, and I hate to rag on a game with so much promise from such a small, passionate team, but I feel obligated to warn you if you're thinking about buying the game that much of that effort was put into the wrong places. Phenotopia is not at all an accessible game, and even if there were a better checkpoint system or a not hardcore mode where you could instantly heal, or if it was easier to find coins via random drops or through side quests, genuinely, if a single one of about a dozen different things were slightly improved, this game would be a whole lot better. Like that rare metal ore I traded in earlier, there's something truly special underneath all the impurities in Phenotopia. And if it can be refined either with updates or with a sequel down the road, something like this could be a priceless gem. However, like the Recycler, I think anything over 15 bucks for this one is being generous at best. If you've made it to the end, thanks a ton for watching. Hopefully I've helped you make a decision on this game. If you're new here, I release videos like this just about every week, so if that sounds up your alley, make sure to do the thing that I'm obligated to ask you to do, and subscribe. If you want to watch another video about a side-scroller that was in development for several years, I recently released a video about Bloodstained Ritual of the Night and explored its myriad of Kickstarter promises, so give that a watch if that sounds appetizing. As always, until next time, stay golden. And a special thanks to my Patreon supporters for helping me release videos like this as frequently as I do, including Goldstorm07, Wolf Chaosan, Matthew0606, and Buckles Chucklow. If you want to show an extra bit of support, visit patreon.com slash thegoldenbolt. Thank you.